Tea Market Pyramid in here. Tea Market Pyramid in here. You can see this little plant that Katie's showing us. This is called Hearts of Bustin. You can see the little hull um, part of it and then the seeds bust out of it. It's really a beautiful little plant. <laughs> it's unique. precious. This place is covered up with it. It grows wild. And it's often called Hearts of Bustin. I think it's also called like Strawberries Paw. There's a whole bunch of different little Nothing common that. names. And of course, I don't know the Latin name, but a really pretty unique plant. So today I'm going to finally put up my crowd. It's been sitting on the counter, oh, for probably longer than I normally would leave it. Actually, that's not true. I'm really bad to leave it longer than, I think it says that most typical people would say it takes 14 to 21 days to make, to ferment. Sometimes I leave mine longer than that. I leave it till the mood hits me to put it up. I do check it. I do keep check on it. And I also taste it and see if it's a, to our desired wanginess. But today's the day, so I'm going to get it out of here, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it in some jars, and I'm going to put it up. Now, a lot of people ask me about that part. So you could, especially if you make a small amount, or even this amount, if you have a large refrigerator or you have a lot of room, you could just take it out and put it directly into the refrigerator and start eating it. It will continue to ferment slightly in your refrigerator, and then that's fine. You just eat it till it's gone, and it'll last several months like that. If you want to put it in a jar, there's two theories of thought. If you want to put it in a jar, you could just put it in a jar with some of this liquid and close it off and put it on the shelf. Now, a lot of people will tell you don't do that. It's dangerous. So the other way that you would do it is you would put it in a jar, make sure it's got enough brine on it, and then you will water bath it for 10 to 15 minutes, and then you would put it on the shelf. Of course, when you water bath it, you're going to kill all those good little um, microbes, all that little fermentation, that great bacteria that's gut healthy that you've created. So one easy way to do it is, or to think about it is maybe you put, especially if you make a large amount, even larger than what I've made today, is that you keep some of it in the refrigerator to eat fresh and then you can the rest of it so then it's more shelf stable and then you can have it uh, during the summer, win winter and in the coming months. So those are the two schools of thought. I'm going to probably keep some in the refrigerator and then also see how much I end up with when I actually get it out here and decide if I want to water bath some for the shelf. So the, the kraut has a fermented smell, kind of a yeasty smell. I don't see any mold, which is really good, but even a little mold is usually, whoops, usually typical, and that's okay. You just scoop it out. This is the cabbage that was on top that I had to, using it to weigh it down. 
So I'm going to get rid of those little pieces. And I'm going to take a bite, see what I think about it. Mm. Very good. Very wangy. Mm. So good. Man, some cornbread would be really good with that. It tastes so good, it makes me want to get some in a bowl and take it down to Granny and let her taste it so she'll know I did a good job. I might do that. But now I'm going to work on getting the rest of it out. Such pretty crap. So I finished canning my kraut and doing what I was going to do with it, put a little bit in the refrigerator so we could eat it fresh. And I saved a little bowl out for Matt. So he's been at work. He just got home from work so that he could taste and see how it turned out. So this is putting him on the spot. Very good. Yeah. Turned like out it. good. Yeah. A little tart the way I like it. Very tart and very crunchy still. Mm -hmm. it's yeah. Very good. That's some of the best we've made. I think so too. You did well. Well, you did it. You did too. Wow. Well, we both did well. That'll work. I like it. Mm -hmm. I just wish we had about 50 jars of it. So this morning I'm picking ground cherries. Actually, I'm eating more than I'm picking. But you wait till ground cherries are ripe once they fall on the ground after they their little paper lantern turns kind of dry and wispy and and then they fall onto the ground and they turn this yellow color. And that's how you know they're ripe. A lot of people gather ground cherries to make sauces and different things like that. I think you can make ground cherry jelly. I'm sure you can. But I mostly enjoy eating them just straight out like this. I'm the only one in my family who actually likes them. No one else cares for them. They remind me of being a little girl in my big grandma, my great grandmother's garden. That's where I remember seeing them. And once you have ground cherries, you have them forever. <laughs> they just spread and they come up in different places. And that's a good thing if you really like them. If you don't like them, it might be a bad thing. But again, you, but you could just pull them up. They're not like invasive. They would be easy to pull up. But I enjoy that they show up in different areas of my garden every year kind of like the ultimate volunteer if you like how they taste if you don't maybe not so much I have a video with more information about ground cherries and I'll link to that so you can check it out This is a sweet gum tree. They grow everywhere, all around our house. They grow to be so many that a lot of them we just have to cut down when they're small. There's some really big ones up there, but these little ones grow up everywhere. I love them because of their leaves. You can see the shape of their leaves. Stars are my favorite shape, and those kind of remind me of a star. They have a distinctive leaf that's very pretty. It's one of my favorite trees. On mature trees, their little fruit that they drop, the sweet gum balls, maybe you've seen them before. They have little pokey things all over them. Almost look like a little ball that reminds you of a porcupine. A lot of times you'll see people 
uh, take those and use them as decorations. I've made Christmas decorations before. One time me and the girls dipped them in flour and then they were white and then that's what we put on the Christmas tree. So lots of memories for sweet gum trees in my area of Appalachia. Today I'm cutting the very last of our sugar baby watermelons. A lot of you, a lot of people ask me what this was because they've seen it sitting on my counter. Uh, it's a sugar baby watermelon. They're very sweet. This is actually the largest one I grew this year. My watermelons, because I don't get a whole lot of sunshine, don't always get the biggest. But, but even the ones that are like softball size are so sweet. It's a really good variety to grow if you have a small garden space.
we've been buying corn from a farmer down the road and I had just a little bit left over that was trying to get going to get go bad on me because I'm not going to have it for supper tonight. So I've been putting some in the freezer all along, but today I thought that I would make a couple of jars of pickled corn. Now, Papa Tony makes the best pickled corn and beans ever, and I was hoping this summer to go out and video him actually making it, but that didn't work out, but hopefully I can do that in the future. But this is another very simple recipe. Years ago, when I'd, I guess I'd wrote about Papa Tony doing the pickled corn, uh, and there's photos and stuff. I'll link to that, pickled beans and corn. There was a gentleman that was reading the blog at that time, and he left his granny's recipe. Well, it was really simple, and I tried it, and it worked out really well. So that's how I, if I have just a little bit, that's how I do it. The best, though, is Papa Tony's, the old way of doing it in the crock. So first, I've got some jars here that I've sterilized. So they've already been sterilized. They're clean, and I've got some lids for them. I've actually already boiled my corn. I boiled it for about four minutes and then I've cut it off the cob. And now I'm gonna pack the corn into the jars. It's so good, I really can't help but eat some of it as I do this. I've been eating it every time I would cut some off. I'd have to take some, take a bite. And I'm using Silver Queen. That's the corn that we like the best. Now that I've got the corn in the jars, I'm going to add a teaspoon of salt to each jar. The gentleman that left the recipe years ago said that if you were using um, like really sweet corn, kind of the those hybrid sweeter varieties, that you might want to use two teaspoons. But I always use Silver Queen, so uh, but you could definitely use more. And then after you add that, you're going to fill the jars with hot water. And he says, fill them all the way up to the top. So that's what I always do. You want to make sure that the corn's covered. Now I'm gonna seal them up loosely. I'm not gonna put them very tight because these are gonna sit. So just kind of snugly, but where they're still kind of loose. And then I'm going to set these in a cool, dry, dark kind of place, not cool as much as dry and dark, and let them work for about, oh, nine to 14 days, maybe a little longer. And as they work, you might want to set them in a, like on a bread pan or something like that, because some juices might bubble out of them, might make a mess, so be careful about that. Then once they're finished and I taste them and they're fermented to, to where we would like them, you know, they're sour, fermented enough for us, they're pickled enough. Since there's just two jars, I will probably just store them in my refrigerator. If you had several jars, he's, his suggestion, and I've done this before, is to, once they're, work, they're finished working to your liking, remove them, the lids and kind of clean up the jars if any of that stuff, any of the workings has come out and then seal them up tightly, and then water bath them for 15 minutes. So, but if you just make a couple of jars like I'm doing, it's pretty easy just to store them in the refrigerator. I found this Katie did hanging out on Granny's porch. The season for Katie dids is almost over. Today in Southern Appalachia, cool air, the coolest air we've had so far, this end of summer and early fall has come in. By Friday, it's supposed to be in the upper 30s. So the time for Katie dids is just about done.
this plant right here you can see the it's called doll's eye usually and you can see why looks like a baby doll's eye doesn't it usually there's more of them and I've always thought it was a really creepy creepy plant even though I love baby dolls but just the eye looking at that eye and it is poison you wouldn't want to eat it but it's just a unique plant to see growing wild So this little plant that you can see growing low to the ground is grows wild and it's called partridge berry. You can see some of the berries there. There's a red one. There's one. They're edible, but they're pretty much tasteless. They don't really taste like anything. But it's such a pretty little plant. I don't really have it growing at my house in Brasstown, but I wish I did. But it's growing everywhere through Nolan Creek where we're at today. Mama made made this for our 25th birthday. That's so sweet. It looks so yummy. We're excited to eat it. Homemade cakes are just the best, period, but especially for your birthday, that's sweet. And, and Mom has usually always made us some kind of sweet treat for our birthday, so we really appreciate it. Now let's dig in! <laughs> yes.